Yeah. Okay, Angela, um, thanks very much for the uh, introduction. And, um, apologies for not being there in, in, in person. Um, but what I would like to do is speaking about oplasmic reorganization in Acelian. And um, not perhaps, you know, there are some of you which don't know Acelian since they are shown here in this picture. They are, in fact, actually the most closely related invertebrate species to humans, which is perhaps not entirely obvious from this picture. But if, if you look at an earlier stage, and uh, in uh, development, then you can see that, they are, that the larvae of Brazilian species are looking quite similar to, for example, tadpoles and xenopoles, and not completely dissimilar to human embryos. So studying Brazilians um, is worthwhile. And it's actually worthwhile also because Brazilians have something which um, humans don't have, and that is an invariant cell lineage, meaning that the fate of each plastomere, which is shown here in green, for example, um, is can be... Uh, uh, and, um, can be exactly determined, then it is essentially invariant. So we know from each plasmodia which organ and which uh, tissue in the in the embryo and later on in the adult organism is formed by the cell. This is a uh, um, very useful feature because it um, um, is set already at a very early stage of development, essentially in the oocyte or egg. And it is determined by the uh, distribution of maternal determinants within the oocyte. And in particular, the asymmetric distribution of maternal determinants, which then segregate asymmetrically in different blastomeres. And then the blastomeres take on a, a you know, specific fate and will form later on uh, different tissues and organs. So, so essentially, the blueprint of development in acidian embryos, and to some degree in other invertebrate and vertebrate embryos as well, is already set within the oocyte. So if one looks in the oocyte and tries to understand how different maternal determinants are being distributed within the oocyte, one gets information about um, the future embryonic development. And this has been um, first recognized by Conklin, you know, more than 100 years ago in a seed in embryos. And what he uh, identified is a structure which he called the myoplasm. It becomes uh, obvious because it has a, a yellow color. And what he found is that the myoplasm, it's a mitochondria-rich structure, accumulates at the vegetal pool of oocytes, and then it segregates into different blastomeres, and these blastomeres give rise to specific tissues. So he could really um, correlate uh, the segregation of a specific structure within the oocyte uh, to a specific cell fate and an organ later on formed. Now then, work in, in the Nishida lab um, um, over the last uh, 10, 20 years has shown that uh, this structure, the myoplasm, actually contains RNAs, and these maternal RNAs are being segregated into different um, blastomeres, and then they are determining the fate of these blastomeres. So, so essentially, knowing about the distribution of, of these uh, maternal RNAs tells you something about the lineage of these cells and uh, the future embryonic development. Now, the question which um, has been out for many years now is what determines the positioning of the myoplasm within the oocyte egg. And um, the, this has been... Um, probably best uh, addressed by uh, the lab of Sardi and, um, you know, um, uh, over the last 10 years. And what they came up is, is sort of an elaborate proposal how the myoplasm accumulates um, at the vegetal pool of these Acedian uh, oocytes. And what they propose is uh, that there's flows, and you can see it here on the left side, there's flows of act cortical actomycin from the animal pool towards the vegetal pool, leading to accumulation of cortical actomycin and then uh, um, correlating with that the accumulation of the myoplasm. And there is some sort of in, uh, interesting interaction between the actomyosin cortex and the myoplasm, leading to the accumulation of uh, actomyosin and, uh, and, and the myoplasm at the vegetal pool, leading to the formation of a structure which he called the contraction pool. It's sort of a protuberance on the vegetal pool of the oocyte, distinctly uh, uh, visible. And this uh, contraction pool then essentially uh, relaxes uh, a little later on and then in, in another uh, number of steps, the myoplasm is being pulled over by, by microtools to the posterior side of uh, the oocyte, and then it segregates into blastomeres giving rise to a specific structure. Now, we thought that this proposal is an interesting proposal because it is a testable proposal, and uh, this is uh, then the work which um, Silvia Caballero, a PhD student in the lab, uh, took on. What she wanted to understand is how is the myoplasm actually accumulating at the vegetal pool of the oocyte how does it lead to the formation of the contraction pool and eventually patterning of the oocyte? Now, the, the first thing which um, Sylvia then did, did is um, she uh, uh, looked at the, uh, dynamically at shape changes of the oocyte 
upon fertilization, and what you see here is an unfertilized oocyte. And what is happening when the oocyte is being fertilized is a couple of distinct shape changes, first an elongation, then a, a little flattening, then the formation of the contraction pull down here, and then eventually the relaxation um, um, and resolution of the contraction pull at the vaginal pole. Now what she did is then she subdivided this, these uh, shape changes of the oocyte into three distinct um, uh, phases. The first phase when the oocyte is uh, slightly elongating and then flattening at the vaginal pole, which she called uh, contraction pole initiation. Then you have the expansion of the contraction pole. This all happens in a, in a scale of minutes. We are talking here about uh, three minutes for initiation, then another three minutes, uh, six minutes for the expansion, and then 30 minutes for the absorption of uh, the contraction pole again. Now, um, this sort of set the stage of what she wanted to understand, and she wanted to relate that now to um, uh, the rearrangement of the uh, cytoskeleton within the, the oocyte un underlying the mechanism by which uh, these shape changes occur in the oocyte. Now, the first thing she did is uh, she inhibited um, actin polymerization and uh, myosin uh, uh, contraction, myosin 2 uh, dependent contraction within the oocyte by um, incubating them to, um, exposing them to latrunculine and uh, expressing a constitutive acting form of myosin phosphatase. In both of these cases, what she finds is that these shape changes of the oocyte are not occurring anymore, indicating that actin and myosin activity are required for these shape changes. This is uh, very much in accordance with previous studies by the, by the uh, study lab, which has shown that this early myoplasm segregation depends on actomyosin contraction. If she uh, in, inhibited uh, uh, microtubules in contrast, there was uh, very little um, effect on the formation of the contraction pole and the early accumulation of the myoplasm at the vaginal pole. Now, the next thing is then that she wanted to do live imaging and see how uh, dynamically actinomyosin uh, redistributed within uh, uh, the oocyte open fertilization. On the left side in green, we have actin, we're looking at F actin here, and on the right side, we're looking at myosin 2. And um, when the movie now starts to run, fertilization is occurring, and what you see is that both actin relocalizes uh, very strongly to the vaginal pool, myosin does so as well. You get an accumulation, then eventually it goes away again from the vaginal pool, and the contraction pool, which transiently forms, disappears again. So there is uh, very distinct changes in the accumulation of actinomyosin within the oocyte, coinciding with these distinct shape changes of uh, contraction pole formation and absorption. She looked very carefully at the distribution, and you know this is just uh, different stages. We are looking here at the initiation of the contraction pole, and then the expansion of the contraction pole, and the absorption. And interestingly, the, the peak of actin and myosin accumulation happens at the end of uh, the initiation stage, before the contraction pole fully forms. And during the expansion phase, actinomyosin already disappear at the uh, vaginal pole, and during the absorption, they are nearly completely gone again. So, so that sort of uh, points at an interesting um, um, uh, crosstalk between actinomyosin uh, localization within the oocyte and these shape changes, which is perhaps not completely, completely intuitively um, accessible now. now what uh, she wanted to do then is uh, looking at these um, uh, um, localization changes and correlating them with flows of actinomyosin. And what she finds is that the early accumulation of actinomyosin at the vaginal pool, you can see it here, um, uh, correlates uh, with, um, the, uh, with flows of uh, both actin and, and myosin as determined by PRV analysis. So you can see that there are flows originating from the animal pool and um, directed down to the vaginal pool and these flows eventually lead to the accumulation of actin and myosin 2. During the expansion phase, interestingly, there is no flows anymore, and during the absorption phase, neither. So, so the initi initiation phase is where most of the actomyosin flows are occurring, while during the expansion and absorption, there are no flows anymore. Now, this sort of pointed at the interesting uh, observation that actomyosin flows and accumulation precede contraction pole formation. We thought originally that they lead to contraction pole formation, but they seem to precede the formation of the contraction pole. Now the question is, how are these flows being induced? And what she did then is she looked uh, again very carefully at the uh, um, distribution of actin. Now we're looking at uh, stacks of actin, so uh, you know, pseudo 3D images of the oocyte. And what she found is that uh, uh, at the onset of actomyosin flows, there seemed to be a crack of the uh, um, actomyosin cortex at the animal pool, and this crack of the actomyosin cortex expands 
um, leading to the flows, the, the peeling of the ectomycin cortex down to the vaginal pool, the accumulation of actin and myosin at the vaginal pool. And then eventually this <clears throat> is followed by the expansion of the contraction pool and the absorption of the, the contraction pool. So there is something happening at the animal pool <clears throat> which coincides with fertilization and which um, uh, leads to the breakage of the actomyosin cortex at the animal pool and then this, these very fast flows of actomyosin downwards. We wanted to see if we can mimic this uh, breakage by taking and fertilized the uh, oocyte and that's what she did is in using a UV, la UV laser cutter and then cutting uh, the cortex in the unfertilized oocyte where there are no flows and seeing if, if one can it, induce ectopic flows. And that's what she's doing here. She cuts, and you might be able to see that there's flows of actomyosin now directed downwards towards the uh, vegetable pool. You can also see that in, in, the, in, in a chymograph, we'll be looking at uh, the AV axis um, as a function of time, and you can see then that actomyosin starts to flow very strongly once the cut has been done. So that indicates once uh, the, 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 the cortex breaks at the animal pool, even in the unfertilized uh, uh, oocyte, this in, um, leads to flows, very fast flows of actinomycin downwards to, towards the vegetable pool. Now, the, 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 the next thing then she wanted to understand is how tension uh, within cortical actinomycin tension evolves within the, the oocyte during the fertilization and uh, contraction pool formation process. And what she did is she, me she measured the cortical tension using micropipettes, and she did it uh, on the animal pool, and she did it on the vegetable pool. And what you can see is that during initiation, there's a very strong increase in tension at the vegetal pool and less so at the animal pool. And this leads <clears throat> to a strong buildup of a tension gradient from the animal to the vegetal pool, which then presumably open fertilization during the initiation phase leads to the breakage of the cortex and the flow of the cortex downwards towards the vegetal pool. Now at this point, we teamed up with um, the group of um, Raphael and, um, and, and Andrew and um, what they did is they uh, used uh, an, an active gel theory to uh, predict if the flows we, we, uh, we are observing, the actin uh, accumulation at the vegetal pool and the actin flows, if that is something one can recapitulate by assuming um, that uh, the actin cortex behaves like an active gel. Now, when, we, when, uh, when they uh, um, looked at the accumulation, they, they saw on a quantitative term very similar accumulation of actin over time at the vaginal pool as what we are finding here in our experimental observations. And likewise, the flow profile matched quite nicely uh, the flow profile we are observing of actinomycin from the animal pool towards the vaginal pool in the simulations as compared to the experimental observations. So that essentially uh, tells us that we're looking here at a contractile actinomycin network where uh, tension increases at the um, uh, vaginal pool and decreases slightly at the animal pool. And uh, this leads to flow of the actinomycin uh, network and accumulation of actinomycin at the uh, vaginal pool of the oocyte. So, so um, what, we, um, what we then wanted to see is if these flows and the accumulation of actinomycin uh, leads to uh, the shape changes we are observing and if it can actually initiate contraction pool formation and uh, what, uh, what we did then together with Raphael and Andrew again is we looked at the distribution of surface tension. I showed you that before, which we are experimentally observing, and the aspect ratio, which is the shape changes of the oocyte. And we are trying to simulate that uh, using, again, the active gel theory. And what we are finding is that, very similar to what we are observing here, uh, the, the tension profile behaves as, uh, as we are observing in the, in, the, um, in the oocyte experimentally. And the aspect ratio um, behaves very similar up to the point of contraction pole expansion to what we are seeing uh, um, experimentally. Interestingly, the contraction pole itself, the, the protuberance, the formation of this protuberance, is not something which we are seeing um, uh, in, in, in the theory uh, um, of the predicted shape changes of the oocyte. Now, the, the question which we are left from, from this uh, um, uh, interplay between theory and experiments is, how is the contraction pole actually formed? Because we are seeing that the shape changes we are observing due to actomyosin flows and accumulation and the tension changes associated with it lead to some cha shape changes which are not the shape changes uh, which lead to expansion, which would not explain the expansion phase we are seeing here. And then eventually, of course, we would like to understand how the myoplasm accumulates at the vegetal pool associated to these actomyosin uh, driven shape changes. Now, what, we, what uh, then Sylvia did is she looked directly at the myoplasm, and you can label the myoplasm because these are mainly mitochondria. 
And, uh, and she then uh, looked at the accumulation of the myoplasm relative to the accumulation of actin and myosin. And what you can see is here in blue is the myoplasm during the CP initiation phase. And you can uh, see then what the actin is doing. And, and this goes pretty much hand in hand. As the actin moves down, the myoplasm accumulates, uh, indicating that there is some sort of uh, interaction between the actomyosin cytoskeleton, corticocytoskeleton, and the myoplasm, leading to the accumulation, presumably leading to the accumulation of the myoplasm. As I told you before, the myoplasm is an, uh, a mitochondria-rich domain, which is um, connected via the cortical ER to the cortex of uh, the, um, uh, the oocyte, indicating that there could be some mechanical interaction between uh, the mitochondria of uh, the myoplasm and the cortical actomyosin inside the skeleton, which could take on the form of a friction force evolving between a fast-moving actin inside the skeleton adjacent to uh, this, this myoplasm, uh, which is connected via the cortical ER. Now, we wanted to understand how the myoplasm might react to such presumed friction exerted at the interface between uh, the cortical actomyosin cytoskeleton and the myoplasm. And what uh, uh, Sylvia then did is she used, again, a UV laser cutter to cut the myoplasm. And what she found is that these cuts are actually just revealing a very solid phase of, these, uh, of, of this myoplasm. The myoplasm is essentially a membraneless uh, organelle in the, in the oocyte. Um, and there's very, very little um, uh, um, uh, recovery of that, indicating that you're looking here at a, at a solid. Um, then what she, what, what, what she wanted to know is, uh, you know, dynamically see how the myoplasm deforms as a function of uh, actin flowing down. And uh, again, what we are looking here is a movie. On the left side, we have actin. On the right side, we have the myoplasm. The myoplasm is not equally distributed to start with already. It is less. Uh, accumulated at the animal pool and more accumulated at the vegetable pool. So is actin has already a slight gradient before fertilization actually sets in. This is to prior polarization of the oocyte. And then once uh, the flow of actin sets in, you can see that the myoplasm goes down. And then you form these interesting buckles of the myoplasm down at the vegetable pool, which eventually uh, resolve um, once the contraction pool um, has been um, um, absorbed again. So there is something happening between actomyosin flows and uh, the relocalization and buckling of the myoplasm, um, which could explain how actomyosin via friction forces deforms this elastic solid here, leading to uh, buckling of the, uh, of the myoplasm. Now, just to show, show you that in a few stills, um, the, on, on the bottom, you can see actin flows accumulating actin at the vegetable pool contraction pool formation and then partial um, absorption of the contraction pool. And coinciding with that, we see that the myoplasm relocalizes towards the eventual pool. And you get these interesting buckles forming, multiple buckles forming. And these multiple, multiple buckles resolve into one prominent buck buckle, which coincides with the contraction pool. And then eventually, the whole thing is being resolved again. So, so um, but what we are having is we are forming initially a number of a, a larger number of uh, buckles at the end of uh, contraction pool initiation, and then these numbers of buckles are reduced again into essentially one big buckle, which co uh, co uh, co localizes with the uh, um, contraction pool down here, um, indicating that uh, there, there might be a there might be a um, elastic instability of the the myoplasm, which when compressed leads to the formation the initial formation of multiple buckles. Then the actomyosin relaxes, the actomyosin cortex relaxes again, and then these buckles uh, resolve into one single buckle, which coincides with uh, the formation of the uh, contraction pool. So, so what we speculated uh, at this stage is that, you know, as I explained, that there's a compression of the myoplasm, which might be due to friction at the myoplasm cortical interface, and that the elastic instability of the myoplasm behaving as a, as a solid elastic uh, material which is subjected to compressive forces lead to myoplasm buckling. Um, so again, we uh, teamed up here um, with, this is uh, the, the model, what we are, you know, the apostles, what we are um, um, following up here is that the myoplasm is initially distributed uh, with a slight polarity along the animal vegetal axis. Then you get flows of actin downwards towards the vegetal pool. You get buckling of the myoplasm. And then you get a relaxation of the cortex again, and the, these multiple buckles resolve into one big buckle, which eventually gives the uh, cortical contraction pool uh, its uh, shape. 
we uh, again teamed up here with Raphael and Andrew, and uh, we looked if the uh, uh, if by assuming friction between uh, the myoplasm and the cortical actomyosin inside the skeleton, and uh, taking uh, into account the flows of the uh, the actin cortex, if we can uh, simulate then this uh, buckling of the the myoplasm, and if we assuming that this uh, cortical tension then uh, resolves again at the vaginal pool we can uh, actually see then the resolution of these muscle buckets into a single bucket. This is just shown here, one of these uh, um, uh, predictions from the theory um, that you can form multiple buckles in, uh, in a medium of a, a certain elasticity. And if you change the elasticity of the medium, then the number of buckets changes as well. So that seems to be a, a plausible assumption, which one uh, then needs to experimentally address. And uh, we, we, and in this case, again, Sylvia did it uh, through different distinct experiments. In the first experiment, what she tried to do is using a micropipette uh, and then aspirating the cortex of an unfertilized oocyte. Uh, on, you know, close to the vaginal pool, this oocyte is unfertilized. And what we are seeing here in blue is the myoplasm. And what she wants to do in this experiment, she wants to induce actomyosin flows into the pipette. And then she wants to understand if these ectopic flows, these ectopically induced flows of actomyosin, would lead to an ectopic buckling of the, the myoplasm in response to these flows, if there's frictional interaction and uh, elastic instability. Now that's the experiment. She aspirates it, and you can see that uh, you know there, there's a tongue forming. And then indeed you see the formation of buckles of the myoplasm right at the point where um, um, actomyosin has flown into the pipe. This is something here, just to show you in a few stills what, what is happening, that's the actual experiment. She sees accumulation of actomyosin within the tongue, uh, the aspirated cortex. Myoplasm usually stays out of the, the pipette. And then what she finds is that there is a local buckling at the edge between the pipette and the myoplasm, where the flows of actomyosin have taken along the myoplasm, leading to a local buckling of the myoplasm. Now, the, the, the this sort of... Um, supports the plausibility that actomyosin flows can lead to to, uh, to buckling of the myoplasm. The question is if contraction pull, the formation of the morphological visible contraction pull, depends on myoplasm buckling and resolution at the vegetable pool. Now, she did a rather crude experiment to test that, and that is taking uh, unfertilized oocytes and putting them into a centrifuge. And essentially, by centrifugating them, dissociating the myoplasm from the vaginal pool. This is now an unfertilized oocyte, which underwent centrifugation. And uh, in this case, what you see is here that the myoplasm has uh, um, disassembled from the vaginal pool, so it's not adjacent to the vaginal pool anymore. And the question is, what would happen then? Would the contraction pool still form in the absence of myoplasm at the vaginal pool? Now, still, you, you have in these centrifuge embryos, you have uh, accumulation of actin. But what you also see is that the um, behavior, the, the, the flow behavior and the bucking behavior of the myoplasm looks very, very defective in these embryos. Um, and if you just look at a couple of stills during, the, during this uh, recording, you can, you can see that actin still flows downwards, um, but the myoplasm not being at the, uh, um, at the vaginal pool, it essentially inhibits the formation of a contraction pool down here because there is no myoplasm buckling, there is no resolution of myoplasm buckling into one big buckle, and those, there's no formation of this uh, protuberance on the, on the vaginal pool during the cortical expansion phase, or a uh, contraction pool expansion phase. Now, this is just a, you know, a quantification of what I explained to you. This is what happens in, in, a, in, in a wild-type oocyte. You can see that the, you know, the contraction pool is forming. And um, in, cases where, uh, in, in cases where centrifugation has happened, then the contraction pool is not forming anymore because the myoplasm is not buckling at the vaginal. She did one more experiment, and that's a very interesting experiment, where she took um, unfertilized oocytes and treated them with eunomycin. And what eunomycin is doing, it leads to an increase of calcium within the oocyte, essentially mimicking fertilization. But in this case, the influx of calcium is, is a, a very long process, leading to uh, a very persistent and long actomyosin flows towards the vaginal pool. And the question is, would these prolonged flows of actomyosin have an effect on the buckling behavior of the, the myoplasm? Again, functionally linking these two behaviors. And on the left side, you see actin accumulating, and you have consistent flows which just continue. And you see that you get a lot of ectopic buckling of the myoplasm in response to these continuous flows 
which do not stop at the time they would usually stop in a wild type of bullseye. And this is just what I, you know, a quantification of what I showed you. These flows are continuing. You see uh, um, um, actin accumulation for quite a long time at the vegetal pool. We can see it here. And this goes hand in hand with the formation of multiple buckets of the myoplasm, which do not resolve in time into a single buckle because these flows are continuing for quite a while. Now, this uh, continuous uh, accumulation and multiple buckle formation also interferes with the formation of the contraction pool because you don't have the uh, resolution of multiple buckles into a single buckle. Um, again, sort of uh, supporting the hypothesis, what we need is actomyosin flows leading to buckling of the myoplasm into multiple buckles. Then these actomyosin flows stop, actomyosin contraction goes down, and these buckles can resolve into one single buckle, which gives rise to the contraction pool. Now that's what we essentially um, wanted to conclude on, on this work here. Um, very much in line with what has been proposed by Sardi, they are actomyosin flows originating at the animal pool and leading to accumulation at the vegetal pool, but different to the idea that this leads directly to the formation of the contraction pool. We see that these flows uh, lead to a buckling of the myoplasm and that the resolution of these buckles of the myoplasm eventually lead to the formation of the contraction pool. And this again then uh, sets the blueprint for further uh, movement of the myoplasm towards the posterior side of the oocyte, and then segregation into different blood stages. Yeah, that's pretty much um, already the, the end of what I wanted to tell you about um, contraction pool formation in uh, ascidian oocytes. This is the lab, and um, these uh, are the funding agencies. Thank you. Yeah, so the idea is that you form multiple buckets because you have a, a, a you know, wide interface between the, the flowing actomyosin cortex and the myoplasm. And then eventually these flows are keysing, so there's no velocity of the actin anymore. And the interface between uh, the, the frictional interface goes down between uh, the myoplasm and uh, the cortical actin. And this leads essentially to the resolution expansion again of the myoplasm, transit expansion of the myoplasm. And then the resolution of these multiple buckets into one big bucket. So it relates to essentially stalling of actomyosin flows once uh, um, all actin has accumulated at the vegetable pool. Yeah, I mean, the, the myoplasm is very similar to the Balbiani body, and the Balbiani body is a phase-separated, you, you, you probably are aware of it, it's a phase-separated uh, entity, um, and, uh, and it has very similar properties to the to the myoplasm. I think it's essentially the, the Balbiani body in Ascidians, which um, has, in this phase-separated entity, it has a, a solid elastic behavior. And it's mitochondria, it's essentially... Yes, um, but we, you know, that's something we are looking into now is the um, the accumulation of mitochondria and the density of mitochondria and the fusion of mitochondria. Um, it clearly uh, it appears as if the, these mitochondria are getting much more dense when when they're accumulating at the vegetal pool, and this could have an effect on the, and you know, presumably the fusion of these mitochondria could have an effect on the material properties of the, the myoplasm.
Yeah, that's something we, we are trying to understand now is uh, if, um, you know, presumably the fusion of mi mitochondria, you know, we have no evidence yet for it, um, could lead to the, the buildup of a structure which has different mechanical properties than if, you, if these mitochondria would not be fused. The mechanical function is, is clear here. We are saying that the, it behaves like a solid el elastic at the time scale of our experiments. It undergoes this buckling and then this buckling needs to be resolved uh, in one big buckle for uh, the formation of the uh, um, contraction pole.